the funding landscape for AI startups is changing in a really interesting way. Here's how. Welcome back to the AI Breakdown Brief, all the AI headline news you need in around five minutes. Today, many of our news stories have to do with the startup landscape in AI, and we're going to start on more of a meta note. Now, in case it wasn't clear that artificial intelligence and generative AI in particular represent something different than just another sort of startup movement, the way in which the startup financing space for AI startups has evolved over the last year has demonstrated that they are just their own different beast. You might have heard me discuss a post from Sam Hogan from back in July, where he wrote, Six months ago, it looked like AI and LLMs were going to bring a much-needed revival to the venture startup ecosystem after a tough few years. With companies like Jasper starting to slow down, it's looking like this may not be the case. Basically, what Sam was observing was a couple things. First, that AI startups, especially post-ChatGPT, had been somewhat more impervious to the shifts that had been happening ever since the Fed started hiking rates, and the broader economy moved out of the zero-interest rate era. Specifically, generative AI startups were still able to raise big amounts of capital at very high valuations, almost entirely based on potential and team and opportunity rather than actual demonstrated growth. Now, specifically, Sam was identifying that the wrapper startups, companies that were sort of just building on other people's APIs, were having a really hard time. And he was writing that before the big labs like OpenAI really started to compete with many of those companies. He also noted that enterprise companies that might have in the past simply partnered with startups were actually building their own AI solutions, customizing open source models, and generally being more proactive than they had been with previous tech changes in the past. Today, there was a somewhat related post on Twitter from Gokul Rajaram from DoorDash that he called Investors of Last Resort. And in it, he discusses how important the role of big tech companies has been and seems poised to continue to be when it comes to startup funding and taking roles that previously had been just for venture capitalists. Gokul writes, The revelation that Character AI is speaking with Google about their new financing round is not surprising in the least. Despite an incredibly engaging product, i.e. 4 million daily active users with the average user spending two hours per day in the product, the company has extremely high burn since they are building their own models, a competitive advantage in the long run. Monetization is non-existent today, although obviously lots of promising future avenues, and competition is on the horizon as modes switch from text to images and video, and Meta readies its own avatars. It's impossible for VCs to underwrite a $5 billion valuation for the company. The only viable investors at this stage for character are Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and a handful of other large corporates. They are price insensitive and are driven by completely different considerations, such as GPU cloud enterprise customer lock-in than venture capitalists are. As we've seen with OpenAI and Microsoft, Anthropic, Google, and Amazon, Stability AI, Intel, and Cohere, NVIDIA, and Salesforce, and other cases, any company building their own foundation models will ultimately need to go this route. It's just far too expensive to train these models, and the ROI and revenue from inference is too far out for the venture model to support. The OpenAI-Microsoft partnership seems to have paid dividends for both parties. With the proliferation of this model, curious to see the implication of this on exits, future financing rounds, strategic flexibility, and of course, long-term commercial success. So one thing that he doesn't get into in that is why the economics don't make as much sense for venture capitalists. But I think that there's probably a lot to explore there. Some of that has to do with the prospects for companies to go exit into the public markets. Some of that has to do, I think, with the overall availability of capital or lack of available capital to the venture capital space as a whole. In other words, there is nothing theoretically that would make it, quote unquote, impossible for VCs to underwrite a $5 billion valuation for character. It's just that in his estimation, their incentives now point them in a different direction, as opposed to the incentives of the big companies like Google and Amazon. Now, this is a phenomenon that I've been watching more broadly and have been talking about on this show as well and that I think is going to have a major impact in how startups are built in the AI space. I don't know yet exactly all of what the implications will be, but if you come back for the main episode or keep listening in the case of the podcast, we'll talk about why, even though the Microsoft OpenAI partnership has set the template, it's certainly far from uncomplicated. Moving on, however, to some more startup news, the information reports that YouTube co-founder Chad Hurley is back 18 years after he started building YouTube with a new startup, iTel, which is using AI in the short-form video space. The company is apparently five-month-old and has raised a seed round from investors including Ron Conway and Kevin Hart's A-Star Capital. From the information, iTel's product is intended to speed up the video creation process by producing scripts based on text prompts, as well as providing inspiration for content creators. Using iTel, users will also be able to record their characters' AI-generated lines, and iTel will generate AI video content based on those recordings. Now, according to the information sources, iTel is not building their own AI from scratch, but is working with existing AI models. And at least to the information, the story here is less about iTel specifically, and more about it being an example of another quote-unquote seasoned tech executive jumping into generative AI. Meanwhile, on the other end of the startup life cycle, 
Airbnb has acquired an AI startup called Game Planner AI that basically no one knows what they do. Airbnb said on Tuesday that it had acquired the company, which was a 12-person startup for an undisclosed sum, although other reports have put the number at around $200 million. Notably to many was that Game Planner AI was co-founded by Adam Chire, who was also previously one of the founders of Apple Voice Assistant Siri. Said Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky in a statement, AI will rapidly alter our world more than any other technology in our lifetime. So again, while we don't know the details here, it seems likely that Airbnb views the future of travel and experiences as involving artificial intelligence in some meaningful way. Speaking of big companies that are all in on AI, popular team and workspace tool Notion has been for some time a leader in the AI space and has just introduced something they're calling Q&A. Q&A is basically an AI-powered search experience that allows members of teams to theoretically sift through a ton of information across all of the wikis, projects, documents, etc. that are contained in Notion to get answers quickly. Now, I should caveat that Notion is a current sponsor of the AI Breakdown. You probably heard their ad yesterday, and they have a few more ads coming up. But I will also uncaveat and say that as I've discussed frequently, I think the big theme of this fall going into next year is AI actually integrating into the workflows in the software that we're using. And Notion is, for me and many others, a primary tool that is doing exactly that sort of integration. Plus, I'm far from the only person who's excited about this release. Balaji Srinivasan writes, Notion Q&A came out. It's already insanely good. Yeah, it's quote-unquote just a better search box, but this is what we need for email and PDFs too. Understanding, not just indexing. Now, of course, Balaji being Balaji, he also asked a thought-provoking question, writing, I wonder if there's a way to do AEO, like SEO, to write documents or entire wikis such that AI can understand them better. Should be lightweight and not interfere with authoring flow, but if there are things one can do along the way, perhaps it'd help. Now, going back to the biggies and what they are building, Google's DeepMind has gotten a ton of press today randomly with an AI that is focused on more accurate weather predictions. Basically, this tool called GraphCast uses decades of historical weather conditions to produce 10-day forecasts, and according to a study published in Science on Tuesday, that model outperformed the, quote, gold standard forecasting model from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts on roughly 90% of metrics tested. Now, of course, this is not just some novelty feature for getting press, but something that has really important implications, especially in a world where weather events have gotten more unpredictable, more devastating, and thus more costly. If we're able to predict, for example, the path of cyclones, or anticipate severe temperatures better and farther in advance, we can take better preparatory steps. Over in the world of geopolitics, U.S. chip exports continue to have their desired impact, as well as the impact that chip makers were concerned about, as Reuters reports that Chinese giant Tencent is now seeking to find AI chip supplies rather than relying on companies like NVIDIA. Said President Martin Law on a call with analysts, quote, We will have to figure out ways to make the usage of our AI chips more efficient, and we will also try to look for domestic sources for these training chips. We got similar news from Tencent rival Baidu last week. Lastly, an interesting story out of Argentina, where the presidential election has come down to two final candidates. A lot of ink has been spilled trying to understand what the potential implications for AI in the U.S. presidential elections next year might be, but we're kind of getting a preview down in Argentina right now. Both candidates have used AI to create imagery and posters, and the campaign of Sergio Massa has also gone even farther when it comes to deepfaking his opponent, Javier Mille. As the New York Times notes, the Massa campaign has also used the system to depict his opponent, Mr. Mille, a far-right libertarian economist and television personality known for outbursts, as unstable, putting him in films like Clockwork Orange and Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Continuing, they write, Much of the content has clearly been fake, but a few creations have towed the line of disinformation. The Massa campaign produced one deepfake video in which Mr. Mille explains how a market for human organs would work, something he has said philosophically fits in with his libertarian views. Now, when the New York Times showed Sergio Massa this particular deepfake campaign, they say that he appeared disturbed and said, quote, I don't agree with that use. Anyway, super interesting stuff out of Argentina. And again, if you're watching to see what will happen with the U.S. presidential elections in AI, that is a good situation to pay attention to. However, that's going to do it for this AI Breakdown Brief. Next up, the main AI breakdown.